Hello. How's it going? <laughs> How are you? I'm happy to be here. Awesome. <laughs> Hello, Mophiles. Today we have a special guest, Dr. Do you like Dr. Andrew Parker? Or Dr. Andrew? My friends call me Andrew. <laughs> Hello, Bophiles. Today we have a special guest. Dr. Andrew Parker is joining us. He is the principal oboe of the Quad, Symphony, Quad City Symphony Orchestra and the professor at the University of Texas in Austin. Yep. He's here to show us a little bit about oboe fundamentals and help us have a really fun time. So thank you so much for being here. Ah, thank you. Happy to be here. Awesome. So you are playing a lot mm -hmm. and yes. teaching a lot as well. Yep. Do you have any uh, advice for switching between performing and teaching? Um, yes, I do. I actually, I think the first thing I would say is that there is actually much less of a difference between those two than we often think, right? I think the, the older I get and the more I progress in my career, the more I realize that there's very little difference between those two, right? Um, Teaching in a way is, is very similar to performing. It's an art form that you have to develop and practice and cultivate and refine and work on. Um, and I think sometimes people just assume that if you can play your instrument well, then you can teach well. And that's not really how it works. You have to work on your teaching. You have to um, work on the fundamentals of your teaching. How do you communicate your ideas? How do you work with each student? And when each student has a slightly different method of learning and a slightly different personality, um, how do you consciously take the information and data you're getting from your performing life and apply it to your teaching life. So the more I see those two things as being symbiotically linked with one another, the better I get at both of them. Does that awesome. answer the question? Yeah, absolutely. I okay. think that's uh, really good advice because there is kind of uh, a lot of writing about one or the other. Right. And it's very important to make sure they're married. Yeah, and in fact, the reason that I continued my job in the QCSO, despite the fact that I... You know, I left University of Iowa and started at University of Texas in Austin, but I kept my position in the Quad City Symphony because I knew that if I could keep having experiences playing this great literature and playing with an orchestra, it was going to continue to deepen my qualities as a teacher as well. Awesome. Uh, Dr. Parker just gave a master class at the Louisiana State University, mm -hmm. which was awesome because we got to hear him play as well as give really good comments on all of our playing. Uh, so thank you for playing. That's oh, really it was awesome. a pleasure. I think it's very important to play in a master class, at least a little <laughs> bit. Um, I mean, it just so that first of all you can reinforce the ideas you're trying to present to the students and demonstrate them in action in real time right particularly when we were talking about for example the read alone exercises mm -hmm. i shared with you guys to really demonstrate what those should look like what those should sound like what the body should be doing while playing i think it's really important to reinforce your ideas with some playing um also i think it's really important for the students to get to hear playing at a whole hopefully at a high level, right? So that they can really continue to inform their imagination as to what's possible on the instrument. Awesome. So this isn't scripted, but that was an excellent segue to what I want to ask you about next, oh, is perfect. the fundamentals of the able playing and some of the read alone exercises that you talked about. Absolutely. Do you think we could get a demonstration? Oh, sure. Yeah, let me just... I need awesome. To... So we'll be right back with yes. a quick demo <laughs> from Dr. Yes. Parker. <laughs> oh, so sorry. I don't just need my so, so we're just uh, waiting on the soaking of our reads in the brief time. Uh, we could actually talk about Dr. Parker's, uh, I don't know what you would say, uh, extensive CD repertoire. Oh, yeah, so. that's a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> a little plug in here. Um, yeah, so actually my third CD just came out pretty recently. Um, so I have three CDs out right now. The first one is a solo album, oboe and piano with a fantastic pianist, Alan Huckleberry, who teaches at University of Iowa. But we did an album of all vocal music. And if we get a minute, it'd be great to talk about that at some yeah, point. Yeah, um, Okay, well, uh, so it's Schubert and Schumann leader and a Beethoven lead as well. So it's all music for voice that I play on oboe and not really any transcription necessary. I just played it in the key in which they're written. Um, they're a good range for the instrument. Um, and the reason I did that, well, there's several reasons I did that. 
I would say the most important reason that I chose that for my first recording project was because I really wanted to demonstrate in the most literal way possible the potential for singing on the instrument. We talk about that all the time. We talk about how important it is to sing on the instrument, to have a singing tone. But what does that really mean, right? It's a beautiful concept in abstraction, but I really want to approach it in the most literal way possible. So I'm actually attempting through my daily practicing and my fundamentals to alchemize or transform the oboe into my voice. So it no, no longer feels like it's something separate from my body or separate from my imagination. It's completely connected to me. And then when I am playing and things are right and my read is balanced, it really just feels like I'm singing. It doesn't feel any different. So with this album, I was attempting to demonstrate the, the capabilities of doing that very thing. Um, and how we can, as oboe players, show the story of what we're playing, the poetry of what we're playing, through how we played, through the, the connection, the line, the phrase, the colors, even though we don't have the text. So that's why I chose that. So always be singing. Right? Exactly, yeah. exactly. So your latest album, is that the trio? Sorry. That's the trio, yep. I just released an album of uh, trios for oboe, bassoon, and piano, all written within the 20th and 21st century. Um, most of which are very not well known, mm -hmm. some of which are very recently composed. So a lot of cool stuff. You know, we all love the Poulain Trio. Mm -hmm. We all love the Previn Trio, right? There's, there's some fantastic, very standard works written for that instrumentation, but what if you have already played those a dozen <laughs> times and you wanna play something else? So this CD, which is called Portraits and Music, will be a great reference for you if you're looking for other literature. Um, that was also recorded with Alan Huckleberry, the pianist, oh. and my great friend Ben Qualio on bassoon. Oh, from the University of Iowa. Exactly. Yeah. And then my other album, the Handel Trio Sonata with Nancy Ambrose King, and my colleague at UT, Kristen Will Jensen, and a wonderful harpsichordist, Jonathan Rhodes Lee. So that one's actually in my car right now. Yeah. I can attest that it's very good. So Thank you. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Is it on iTunes? I think so, yes. All right, so we'll have some yes. links in the description where you can find downloadable uh, tracks on iTunes or just Spotify uh, as well. Oh, Spotify, mm -hmm. excellent. Mm -hmm. Or just old school, get the CD. Mm -hmm. Ready for some read time? I think it's soaked. I think we're ready. So, we're going to talk a little bit about read alone exercises, but before we do, I just want to quickly preface it with explaining why read alone exercises are useful and necessary. And I mentioned this in the master class last night. Mm -hmm. So, the read is a lot less material than the whole oboe obviously, right? There's much less material vibrating, which means there's less room for error when it comes to tone production, right? How you're using your wind, how you're using your embouchure, how much reed is in your mouth, what is the vowel shape or the voicing you're creating in your oral cavity. All those things are going to really need to be very precise and refined in order for you to do read alone exercises at the highest level. The oboe hides some of our errors with tone production. So I do about five to ten maybe minutes of read alone exercises daily. And um, what I like to start with is first just kind of establishing the range that I'm going to be playing on the oboe from the low register to the highest register. And my methodology with this isn't necessarily the only methodology. You might learn something different from your teacher and that's totally fine. But what has worked for me and what I've seen work for my students is um, approaching the read alone exercise with the range of A flat to D flat. A flat being of course the low register and D flat being the extreme high register. So we're gonna get our A flat. So I didn't love my start on that first day flat. I want to try to get a really nice articulation, a really good inception to the note so it sounds really smooth and clean and the pitch is there right from the beginning. Not explosive, but really beautiful, really connected to the wind. So let's try that a couple times. I just want to try starting some A flats. You give it a try. There you go. Kind of yeah, and it's okay to do a couple first aerated just to figure out that balance of airspeed and embouchure and then start to add the tongue, okay? 
Mm -hmm. And what you might hear is that you're either going to, if you're above the pitch or below the pitch, we're often above the pitch mm -hmm. because you're, you have too much grip mm -hmm. or a little too much read in the mouth. The tighter the embouchure is or the more read you have in the mouth, the higher the pitch will be. And if you're a little flat, it either means you don't have quite enough read in your mouth or more likely I would say is you're not starting with quite enough focus and airspeed at the very beginning. So make sure you already kind of have the tone moving when you begin. You shouldn't just create the tone out of a vacuum. It should be kind of already passing through you and you join the energy of it. So think about it that way. Mm -hmm, good, do a few with just air. Good, again. Oh, make wow. sure we're Weird. a little under, yeah. Good. Now add the tongue. Good, that's fantastic. What dynamic level would you call that? Be like a mezzo forte. Yeah, let's try a mezzo piano with the tongue. Good. Maybe a little louder. Just a tiny bit. There it is. And it's really yeah. important that you fight to be precise with your intonation. You can do it with a tuner or have a piano, something to really make sure you're not slipping and sliding. That's part of why this exercise is so useful. Once you kind of really feel like you've got that pretty comfortable and established, and remember, the most important thing while doing this is really, really trying to understand and nurture the idea that the air is going to be doing as much of the work as possible. Of course the embouchure is a part of the equation, but it needs to be secondary to the wind. So what I would do next is work on going from the A flat to the B flat. Okay. Oh, sorry. Go sorry. ahead. All right. So if you're at home watching this, you should pause the video and try that exercise uh, before moving on. It's not as easy as it looks. I <laughs> thought it was going to be really easy, and it's actually, it's really helpful figuring out what's actually happening in your body. Exactly. Yes. So now what we're going to do, step two, is to go to a B-flat. And before we do that, and we're about to do that, I just want to show the listeners really quickly what the final yeah. product will be. So that's what we want to be able to do on the read. Go from A flat up to D flat, back to A flat with great tone, good connection, good intonation. Okay, so but first let's just try to the B flat. Check. Good, good. We're, we're pretty close. So what did you discover going up to the B flat? What do you need to do to help yourself get there in the most efficient, effortless way possible? Uh, so one thing we're trying to avoid is squeezing. Right. We definitely want to avoid tightening or biting. Absolutely. Uh, so I think it's more of a wind speed issue. Air speed, right. Yeah, and then maybe a little bit of a take. Right. And the more we think about it on a musical level, mm -hmm. as a singing, yeah. right, like we were just talking about, the more we really think about how to do it in terms of the direction, the shape, the intentionality of it, the better it's going to be. So yeah, we're increasing air speed, but th air speed, but think about it on a deeper level. We're, we're energizing the tone to that B flat. All right, what else has to happen on a physical level besides the increase in airspeed? Uh, like a little bit of a, of a lift. Yeah, or a collection of the reed into the mouth, mm -hmm. right? So let's watch from the side. Yeah. Watch me do it once, the profile view. So you can see I'm holding the reed with my hand, but I'm not using the hand. Mm -hmm. And a lot of us are going to be tempted to do that. We're going to be tempted to move the reed inward with our hand. The hand shouldn't be part of it, although I suggest using it to uh, just to create stability mm -hmm. in the beginning. I've seen students try to do this with just their embouchure, and the reed flies right out of their mouth. So hold it for, for now. Safety. <laughs> but yeah, for safety. You don't want to break that reed. And don't use a cruddy reed for this exercise. Mm -hmm. You may think, oh, I'm not really, I'm not about to play the Mozart concerto, so I can just use my, you know, read that never really turned out any good. No, use a good read for this, because you need a read that has some sort of balance and integrity to it. Try again. Right, 
fantastic, Danny. I already see now. We'll talk about yeah. that little upward <laughs> the inflection yeah. at the very end. That's something we all, that happens to all of us and that we need to figure out. Finishing notes is another mm. thing you can master with this read alone. Now we try to go up to the C. And the C is going to be our left hand high notes, our A, B flat, B, C. That's going to be the voicing up there. So this is where you're going to start noticing even more of a desire to start biting on the read. Many of us will. Danny, you try it. Wow, I can tell you were working on it this morning. <laughs> yeah, you had a much easier time getting back down to the A flat this time sure. than last night. And that's something all of us may notice when we try these exercises is that we finally get up to the C and we feel good about it. And it sounds in tune and centered and focused. And then all of a sudden we can't get back down to the A flat. We can't find it again. Right. You, re you really feel the like that I was using too much mm -hmm. pressure. Right. So, otherwise, I can't get back down. Exactly. Yeah. And I call it getting stuck in the high register position, right? This is part of the reason why I think it can be difficult in the oboe to do downward slurs, mm -hmm. why it can be difficult sometimes to play a repertoire that has us doing big intervallic leaps, mm -hmm. like that Telemann E minor flute yeah. fantasy. That's a great piece to work on in conjunction with this because of all those leaps from the high to the low and vice versa. So how do we get back from the high to the low? If you tried these exercises and you were tr having trouble with that, the key is to hold on to conceptually and in your imagination, the physical sensation and placement of that A flat position as you leave it. So when you go up to the C, always be kind of carrying that A flat with you. I call it leaving a trail of breadcrumbs, right? So that when you come back down to the A flat, you know very clearly conceptually and in your imagination where you need to get back to. It's super, super important. And like you said, also making sure you're not establishing the C through biting and tightness, mm -hmm. but instead by an increase in focus of the wind, right? Tongue position, tongue is back in the mouth. Also, we talked a little bit last night about voicing in the cheeks and eyes a little, a little bit of lift here. It's like you've eaten something sour, right? So you can have an ooh in the front, but a E up here. So E, E, that's our vowel for the high register, right? Okay, so let's try it one more time. We're going to do it in unison with one another. Actually, this time, let's go all the way, see if we can get up to that D flat. Excellent. Oh, Not it's bad. Amazing. Yeah, it's a. I wanted to go past the pitch. Absolutely. That's a. Yeah. That's a tricky interval. Is from the D flat back to the C. Mm -hmm. It's wow. very easy to kind of place that half step too close together, mm -hmm. right? And then what ends up how that translate on the oboe is a high high register that is almost maybe even sharp or in tune, but then you go to the lesser high register <laughs> and it's actually a little flat afterwards. You have to make sure that, it, once again, it boils down to voicing, it boils down to flavor, it boils down to approaching intonation, not in a vacuum, right? It's not just, I'm at A440 on every note. It's about, <laughs> there's all these relationships and the more you associate those with color and mood, then the easier it's gonna be to play in tune, right? Okay, and then quickly, maybe we talk about and finishing notes for, yes. for a second. Okay, so as we discovered, <laughs> or do we want to do a pause for, so students can try this? Oh, uh, pause the video. <laughs> <laughs> if they haven't yeah, been already. They haven't been already. Also, if this is moving a little quickly, uh, yeah. keep in mind that you can change the speed settings now on YouTube, so that's great. And, mm -hmm. uh, just and try pause it, out. it at any time. Yeah, just too. try it out, have fun. Mm -hmm. So as we discovered before, Danny was having a little bit of trouble with finishing his pitch without it rising mm -hmm. a little bit. And I think the insight we had in there is that there was a little bit over stifling of the reed in order to try to taper at the end of the note. So if you practice long tones on the reed alone, you're gonna really discover how to finish a note where the pitch stays extremely centered and beautiful and stable all the way to the end of the note. 
Let's try it on a B flat. I like to start on a B flat because that's kind of our middle register position. So it's sort of in some ways the most sort of neutral position. So what I want you to try is you're going to sustain a B flat, start piano, pianissimo, crescendo, sustain at the peak dynamic, and then gradually decrescendo. It'll sound like this. and try to get all the way to silence without the pitch changing. Let me try to attack it with mm -hmm. this. Is, do you have any advice for how to get the pitch immediately without, like I keep having to sail around? It boils down to having kind of the airspeed already sort of set up and situated. Remember how we talked about last night when you're playing softer, you have to project further. Yeah. I think you're keeping your tone and wind a little too far in the back. Okay. So have it kind of up here already in your nose sort of right from the beginning. Mm -hmm. You're just a tiny bit under. There you go. Better, oh, better, yeah, 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 that was better than last night, but you feel it's that so urge sales. for it to wanna yeah. just creep up a little bit. You have to really yeah. put a magnifying glass on this process. It feels like you're on the uh, roll of bola. Like you're yes, it's, it's a balance, yeah. absolutely. And what I was talking about in the masterclass last night was, first of all, making sure that you keep the air moving no matter what. There's gonna be an instinct or desire to kind of pull the wind speed back to get softer, which is kind of in a way the opposite of what you really wanna do. You have to keep projecting the tone further and further away. But you do have to dampen the reed somewhat, mm -hmm. right, in order to get softer. The key is to make sure you're not dampening both blades. Mm -hmm. I'm a top lip player, so I dampen from above. I kind of think of it like a candle snuffer. I'm gently extinguishing vibrations from above the sound. But then you have to make sure the bottom lip is staying off the bottom blade of the reed and allowing it to continue to vibrate. From what I understand, there are people that do the opposite and they control from underneath. And if that works for you, great. Is that related to the anchoring of the reed? I think so. Okay. You know, all the a lot of this boils down to like terminology. Okay. And a lot of people <laughs> use these terms, and I, I've seen so often people have two or three different ideas of what, like you may mean, when you say a dark tone, you may not mean the same thing I say right. with a dark tone. So anchoring, I'm not entirely sure even what people often mean when they say I that. I just mean like when you go for the breath, doesn't mm -hmm. really stay on your lower lip. Oh, okay, good. All right, that's nice to understand. So when I take a breath, my reed doesn't stay on either lip. <laughs> okay, <laughs> there you go. I open around it, yeah. It stays almost on my tongue, yeah. Yeah, and then I close yeah. simultaneously from above and below. Yeah. Well, there you go, ladies and gentlemen. So, <laughs> the truth yeah, is revealed. I think so. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess I'll have to go back and watch some of my videos. But I, what I find particularly interesting is when you are trying to gently dampen the vibration of the reed. Are you doing that from above on the bottom or the top blade, or from below on the bottom blade? And I think understanding that and honing that and refining that is very useful. But always remember to place the air first. That's the most important part. All of this is, is, it supports what we do with the air. But I think a lot of us think embouchure first as oboe players. Well, thank you so much for showing us this exercise. Mm -hmm. It's really cool. And I'm really excited to work on it myself. And I hope you guys check it out and get really strong control on your reads as well. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Parker is the professor at UT Austin. He's got tons of stuff going on. So check him out on YouTube, actually, as yeah. well. Yeah, I have several videos yeah. there. Mm -hmm. So we'll put a link in the corners up here to some stuff on, on his YouTube channel. And go check out UT Austin. They're doing a lot of great stuff in the Oboe Studio. And if you need reads, or I'll do a workup for this exercise, or other scale exercises that you can check out, go to obofiles.com. 
And if you want to hear some really great music, <laughs> check out uh, Dr. Parker's new CD and also his old CDs. Mm -hmm. As always, keep singing and playing, and when in doubt, play beautifully. Thank you. Thanks for <laughs> that. That was so yeah, fun. That yeah. was fun. I hope that was helpful. That was so helpful. Good. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching, and special thank you to Dr. Parker for teaching us that amazing fundamentals exercise. I feel like it has already changed the way that I approach the instrument. In the description below, you can find links for Dr. Parker's YouTube channel and some of his recordings. And as always, you can go to obofiles.com if you need reads or for a lot of free oboe resources. Dr. Parker actually chose this year's Texas All-State Etudes, and next week, Obofiles channel will be getting back to working on those auditions. In the meantime, you can keep working on your fundamentals with this exercise. I know the last four minutes of the video we had a little bit of a camera uh, technical failure, so there's only one angle, but I hope you can still get a lot out of what Dr. Parker was teaching us. I found it super useful. If you found this video useful, go ahead and give this video a thumbs up, and if you found it super helpful, hit that subscribe button and share this video with an oboe teacher, an oboe student, or an oboe friend. Thanks a lot guys, and good luck!